Hello, I'm Shane Allsop, the Community Engagement Assistant at eLife, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to September's ECR Wednesday webinar. This series aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. You can now follow us on Twitter at eLife Community and with the hashtag ECR Wednesday. The session is being recorded and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now it's my pleasure to invite Alok Varma, a graduate student at the National Centre for Biological Sciences, India, and member of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group, to introduce today's session and our panellists. Thank you, Shane. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the ECR Wednesday Web webinar on um, the science of science using meta research to make your research more transparent and reproducible. I'm Alok Varma, a member of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group, and I'll be your moderator for today's seminar, uh, webinar. Um, let me begin by telling you a bit about eLife and its Early Career Advisory Group. Uh, eLife is a nonprofit organization that's operating a platform to improve all aspects of uh, research communication by encouraging and recognizing the most responsible behaviors in research. Uh, the role of the Early Career Advisory Group is to influence and support eLife's work and to catalyze broad reform in the evaluation and communication of science, and in particular to represent the needs of uh, researchers at early stages in their careers. Um, to foster a research culture that's healthy for science and for scientists. Uh, so the ECAG champions many different initiatives to achieve this goal, and the ECR Wednesday webinar series is one such brainchild of the ECAG. Uh, today, our webinar panelists will explore ways that you can use meta research or the science of science to make your own research more transparent, rigorous, and reproducible. So let me start with a little housekeeping. Uh, during the webinar, please be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, uh, appreciative and even open to learning from everyone else. Uh, please do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten anyone or encourage such behavior in any way. We reserve the right to ask anyone to leave and or deny future uh, access to subsequent webinars. And if you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome on any of these webinars, please contact eLife Safety Team uh, via eLife Safety Team at the rate protonmail.com, which is on your screen. Um, Okay, so as Shane mentioned, the session is being recorded and will be made available online at a future date. So uh, keep uh, keep your eyes open for that. And if you need any help, please send a chat message directly to Shane also um, via the chat box there. Okay, so we have three speakers today, each of whom will give a presentation lasting approximately 10 minutes. Uh, following these presentations will be a Q&A session. You are welcome to ask a question at any point during the webinar. You can do so by typing in your question into Zoom's chat box, or you can tweet us. We are at the rate eLife community and use the hashtag ECR Wednesday. Um, I will read out your name and your question at the end of the, the Q&A session that happens after all the presentations are done. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, I'd like to now welcome our three speakers. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Tracy Weiss-Gerber. Uh, she's a meta researcher at the BIH Quest uh, Center for Responsible Research in Berlin and a former member of eLive's ECAG. Um, Tracy, we now invite you to share your screen. Okay, thank you, Alak. Um, hopefully everyone should now be able to see slides and they should be advancing soon. So um, yeah, today we're talking about meta research and how we can use meta research to improve science. And I have the challenging task of explaining to you all of meta research in 10 minutes. I'll also talk a little bit about how I got started in meta research and give you a few ideas about some ways that you might be able to met use meta research to make your research um, more transparent, rigorous and reproducible. Okay, so our first question for today obviously is what is meta research? Well, meta research is essentially the science of science or research on research, the research process and research enterprise itself. So when we do meta research, we apply the scientific method to study science itself. And this is a very powerful tool that can help us to improve science by identifying problems um, with the reporting, with the analysis, and with the conduct of scientific research. So meta research can also help us by developing targeted solutions if we're examining the scientific literature or other aspects of science and identifying specific problems, how common they are and what effects they have. That can also lead very directly to allowing us to solve those problems. 
And meta research doesn't just apply to evaluating scientific publications or preprints, it can also be used to evaluate other aspects of the hiring process or the scientific process. So that might include factors like hiring and promotion practices, funding agency practices or policies, educational programs, and journal or institutional policies. So I'll show you a few quick examples of some different types of meta-research studies. The first one is a study that was published in PLOS Biology, and the authors have looked at a very large number of clinical trials. Um, to determine how well they were reported in accordance with various elements of the consort guidelines. So our authors addressing things like blinding, randomization, or inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the authors find that while the quality of reporting is improving over time, many papers are still missing essential information. So there's also an urgent need for us to continue interventions to improve reporting. This is a second example looking at an intervention to actually improve reporting, this time for animal studies. And so here the authors conducted a randomized controlled trial where authors who submitted animal studies to PLOS One were either required to submit the ARRIVE guidelines checklist along with their manuscript or they were not. Um, and there were no other interventions along with that. And the authors found that unfortunately just asking authors to complete a checklist during the process of submitting their manuscript didn't really lead to improvements in reporting. Meta research, as I mentioned, doesn't always have to focus on scientific papers. And so this is a paper where we looked at statistics education practices. And here we found that while almost nine, well, most papers, almost all, in fact, 97% of papers published in top physiology journals were using statistics, um, statistics training wasn't necessarily required to get a PhD in physiology or related disciplines. So two thirds of statistics programs or physiology PhD programs required a, PhD, a statistics course for students who were participating, whereas the remaining third were split between offering statistics as a recommended elective, simply an elective, or having no statistics component for their programs. One of the important things to keep in mind is that meta research is not meta analysis. Um, because most both of terms involve the word meta, people often get confused between them. And so I just want to emphasize that these are rather different things. When we do meta analysis, we start by performing a systematic review, and that helps us to identify all studies that have addressed a particular research question. And then in the meta-analysis, we combine the results of all of those studies addressing of that particular question in order to assess the size and the direction of the effect based on the literature as a whole, instead of looking at individual studies themselves. So again, this is quite a different process from the process that we go through for science of science studies. However, there are some commonalities between meta-research and meta-analysis. So when we're thinking about meta research that looks at a body of literature, as opposed to other aspects of the scientific system, then meta research and meta analysis share the commonality of the, of the fact that both are looking at a body of literature instead of just single individual research articles. Meta research also borrows a lot of methodology from systematic review and meta analysis. However, sometimes meta researchers review other types of records beyond publications, like funding agency or journal policies, course requirements, tenure and promotion criteria, or other factors. And while most meta research studies don't involve meta analysis, there are exceptions depending on your research question. So, for example, if you're looking at whether blinding studies produce larger effects on a particular outcome, you might need to perform a meta analysis to get the answer to that question. So, why did I start doing meta research? I became involved in meta research because I was concerned about a problem in my field. Um, I study preeclampsia, and while women develop preeclampsia and very similar symptoms at the end of pregnancy, they often get problems, fetal problems, and placental problems, and different pathways in each, in each of those. So for any biomarker we look at, we expect it to be perfectly abnormal in some women with preeclampsia and very abnormal in others. And 
This was a problem because we often present data in bar graphs. So I started off addressing this problem with some of my colleagues by looking at bar graph use in the physiology literature and examining the problems with the use of bar graphs and how often authors were doing this. And we published this meta research paper in PLOS Biology in 2015. And since that time, it has contributed to policy changes in a variety of journals, encouraging authors to replace bar graphs with more informative graphics. So the important question for today is how can you use meta research to help you improve your science? And there are a number of different ways you can do this. The first thing that you can do is find meta research on topics that are relevant to your research studies and your methodologies. There are a lot of studies available on topics like open data or adherence to reporting guidelines, statistical problems, pseudo replication, or things like blinding and randomization, as well as many other topics related to scientific publications. And if you start to read data and information from meta research studies, these studies often tell you how you can recognize problems and fix those problems in your own research. And they can also be valuable in explaining to others why it's important to adopt better practices. So you can have discussions about these papers with your colleagues and your friends. Um, if you're not sure where to start with finding meta research papers that are potentially relevant to you, then we published a recent editorial that contains a variety of different examples of meta research papers. And the editorial is available open access and you can see box one for a variety of studies that will help you identify common problems and explore solutions. I'll highlight just a couple of examples. The first study looks at the problem of power um, statistical power, and the authors present data illustrating that underpowered studies are very common. They then go into detail examining the stat problems that underpowered studies create, and they explain why low power is an issue even when you don't find a significant difference between groups. This is the second example of a meta research study that might be relevant to you. Um, and there are several studies like this, but the authors examined blinded versus unblinded studies, and they found that blinded studies generally find <clears throat> or unblinded studies generally find larger effects. And this means it's important to use blinding whenever possible at all stages of the experiment. And depending on your reporting guideline, you may need to report guiding, blinding for status like for participants, caregivers, outcome assessors, or data analysts. This is another study looking at um, the effects of attrition in experimental research on cancer and stroke. And the authors find that 7 to 8% of animal studies are excluding with animals without explanation and that about two thirds of papers lack the information needed to determine whether animals were excluded. And this is a problem because if we are excluding animals in a biased way, especially in small sample size studies, that increases the risk of spurious findings. A solution for this problem is to use flowcharts to report all excluded animals, as well as the reasons why observations were excluded, which allows your reader to assess the risk of bias. Another way that you can use meta research to improve your own research is to find or start a reproducibility journal club. And these journal clubs are a grassroots initiative that make it easy to start your own club, journal club that discusses meta research studies, as well as findings from other studies that are relevant to ways that you can improve your research. Um, while this is a movement that has started with psychology, it's now expanded to many different institutions and countries and is also beginning to expand to other disciplines. And so these groups can be a great place to meet like-minded people who are also interested in meta research and science improvement and engaging in critical discussions about some of the solutions for improving science and the strengths and weaknesses of those solutions and how we can all make our science more transparent, rigorous, and reproducible. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, it's a very nice overview of what's going on with Meta Research. Uh, up next is Yulia Felling. Um, Yulia is a research fellow in the Hospital for Sick Children Program for Cell Biology in Toronto and was a participant of the Meta Research team of the 2019 20 cohort of the eLife Community Ambassadors Program. Um, and she'll talk to you about that today. So, Yulia, it's all yours. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, nice introduction. 
uh, I will talk today about the lessons learned from the eLife Ambassador Met Research Team. And uh, in the 2018-2019 year, uh, the group of uh, early career researchers uh, were participating in the initiative led by the eLife Community Ambassadors. Uh, and uh, uh, we decided to create uh, uh, the meta research uh, project. And uh, uh, this study was led by the Tracy and in her method of learning by doing, uh, we decided to investigate and uh, uh, to clarify how to create clear and informative image-based figure for scientific publication. So in order to create this uh, study, we uh, started with a, a definition of our research question and objectives. Uh, this research question and objectives should be well-defined, clear, logical, feasible, interesting, novel, and feasible. And in order to define so, we need to follow several steps. First, we needed to define our problem that uh, a lot of people while reading scientific papers are known to go first to the figures and read them. And therefore it's important that figures are accessible to the broad audience. And uh, for example, figures uh, from the papers outside of the one immediate area of uh, expertise are often difficult to interpret and making um, uh, science uh, opportunity to communicate much more harder. So uh, after we defined our problem, we decided to investigate and validate our data with a preliminary research. And uh, uh, many researchers uh, discussed fraudulent image manipulation and technical specification of the image acquisition. However, data, how legible and uh, interpretable images are missing. So. Uh, a lot of recent evidence suggests recently that it's important to, to include methodological data uh, about the image acquisition in uh, the papers and its uh, information are often uh, missing. Uh, next step was to formulate our research question and our research question was exactly how good the quality of the reporting and accessibility of the image based figure among the papers uh, published in the top journals. And the factors that we decided to assess uh, included, uh, for example, the representation of the scale bars, uh, explanation of the symbols and labor, clear and accurate uh, insert markings, uh, and uh, a transparent reporting of, of the object of the species and the tissue that has to be shown, for example, in a legend or figure in order for the reader to interpret the data correctly. We also examined whether images and labels are accessible to the readers with the color blindness and other problems. So once we defined our uh, research question, we needed to uh, state our uh, sampling frame. And it has to be a clear rationale for the sampling fr uh, frame and it has to be uh, appropriate uh, size. So we decided to uh, choose all the original research articles published in April of 2018 in the top 15 uh, journals uh, uh, for the original research in three different uh, categories. Uh, Biology, plant science and cell biologists and we decided on those top journals uh, 15 top journals according to the impact factor uh, from the year 2016. Once the sample frame was ready we needed to screen the journals and eliminate those that didn't publish original research for example review journals. Uh, after the journals was ready the uh, PubMed search for the all uh, needed uh, articles was being done in a, a defined uh, time period in 2018. And uh, um, all this articles has to be also screened additionally uh, for the full length original research papers and uh, to make sure that they have all the uh, images uh, that the area of our interest and uh, the continuous data and uh, all the articles was uh, um, reviewed by the two different abstractors. 
After the, uh, we decided with our uh, uh, number of our papers, we created our abstraction protocol in order to easily to uh, convert uh, all the context of the paper to the uh, review. And all the figures were reviewed by the two different abstractors and uh, in both uh, main uh, paper and supplementary files. Uh, before the, um, we, make sure that the training was uh, done to the, all the abstractors and uh, the abstractors completed uh, 25 article training to ensure that all responses was similar before starting the data abstraction. And during the abstraction, two independent uh, reviewers would blindfoldly uh, uh, screen uh, one paper and uh, uh, primary and secondary uh, outcomes will be abstracted for each uh, uh, article. And then later on, this agreement would be resolved by the uh, census. After the, all the abstraction was done, any uh, additional level of the, our um, reproducibility, so to say, was uh, that we did the quality of our assessment and uh, data extraction. So this way, the 10% of all the articles from the different field were verified additionally to the one quality assessment uh, uh, abstractor who uh, did it in all the field and uh, in order to synchronize all the people uh, taking the place in this study. So a uh, few uh, um, to put in our results in the context, it was important for us uh, to also represent the images in order to illustrate what we was abstracting for. For example, we was looking for the missing or in inappropriate information on the scale bars. And if you ca uh, can see from this example images, uh, how could a uh, no scale bar or a scale bar that blending in the background is could be uh, represented in the paper. And according to our uh, data, almost 50% of the journals in the physiology uh, had the no scale bar information or partial information in the uh, on the size of the images represented. It's a little bit better in the cell biology field and in the plant science, it's up to the 70% had a, a almost partial uh, information on the scale bar images. Another example from the, uh, uh, in our study, we also wanted not only to show the problem, uh, but also to suggest the solution and uh, uh, educate people how they can make it better. So for example, in uh, any case, how the scale bar uh, could be represented in the different ways that could be visible and could uh, readable for the people. Another example in our uh, uh, paper and research where we did the analysis for the misplaced or poorly marked insects. Insects are often an uh, important part of the images in the uh, scientific papers. And uh, often one could see that they are only placed uh, or uh, marked incorrectly, which is making very difficult for the people to find where exactly the uh, a paper are showing it. And it's important also to show in a visible way for the reader that uh, where exactly the insets are finding. And here on the uh, right side, you can find the examples of it, how you can uh, represent. And for example, uh, talking for the um, results uh, that in the case of the poorly marked insets, uh, there are almost 30% uh, of the papers in the physiology uh, did uh, not uh, uh, market correctly and in the plant science it's even more. In the case of the description of the insects, uh, it's uh, uh, also important sometimes to uh, explain what are you doing in your legends that the people are following you. So it was up to 50% uh, in each field uh, that the, uh, those insects was not clearly described. We also in our paper uh, abstracted for the different categories uh, also and recommend uh, 
uh, for the image blind, uh, uh, color blind people or other things that you can read from the our paper. So putting in the context paper that met all good uh, practice criteria according to our analysis in the physiology, it was 16%, uh, cell biology 12, and in plant science, it was uh, only 2%. And uh, such image representation affects clearly uh, the science ability to interpret, predict, and to build upon another scientist's work. So just uh, putting uh, all the uh, knowledge that I learned from the eLife uh, ambassador team and the meta research uh, project, uh, uh, one, uh, I realized that the, there are also problems in my field. For, for example, uh, in the case of the uh, I did my PhD on the uh, in microbiology on the Aspergillus fumigatus, and what is uh, and, uh, was noticeable that uh, all the PhD students or early career researchers are discussing that uh, often in the papers the background lineage of the Aspergillus fumigatus is not mentioned or mentioned incorrectly. And for example, uh, it's uh, clearly once you are doing meta research on such topic, you can uh, put the number to the problem and communicate such problem much more uh, clearly to the audience. For example, almost 20% of the papers uh, published on the Aspergillus fumigatus had never mentioned it background lineage of uh, uh, this fungi, which is making the results of this paper uh, in, uh, interoperable and useless for the scientific community in the future. So uh, with all this, I would like to thank you for the, your attention. And if you want to read more about our meta research paper, uh, you can do so on this link and you can contact me on the Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, it was nice to hear about this project, which is it's quite nice to uh, assess images and uh, something that we do all the time. Um, so our final panelist is, uh, is Clever Nebus. Uh, he's part of the coordinating team of the Brazilian Reproducibility in Initiative. Um, so Clever, please go ahead and share your screen and uh, it's over to you. So, so well, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation. I, I work, uh, as Alok mentioned, with the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. So uh, the, the context of the initiative is that a lot of meta research actually it came about in, in response to a, a, a perception of a reproducibility crisis in the last decade or two decades. And uh, a, a lot of initiatives came uh, from it, like many mentioned already in, in the previous talks. And one kind of effort that uh, became kind of common was, was the, the reproducibility initiatives. Let's uh, get a lot of, of published results and try to replicate them, try to, to repeat the experiments and, and, and compare the results. And the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative is one such uh, replication effort. We're actually focused on a country, so we, we, we try to, we, we aim to, to reproduce 60 experiments uh, from, from Brazilian reproducibility, from Brazilian biomedical research, and, and to estimate the reproducibility of, of Brazilian biomedical science. So uh, much of what I did in the last, uh, this started in 2018, so much of what I did in the last few years was trying to reproduce uh, 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 experiments by, by other people. Of course, we, 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 I'm part of the coordinating team. We actually don't do the experiments, but we coordinate la the labs to do, and we, we work on the protocols, and we try to, to get everything working. So uh, this is the, the workflow, the, the plan for the initiative. So we had to, to figure out what methods what were common in Brazilian papers, and then we had to find Brazilian authors who were willing and, and had the expertise to reproduce uh, uh, such papers using such methods. And then we got uh, to a selection of those 60 experiments I mentioned. I actually want to focus, this is a lot of, the, this previous steps is a lot of research like like uh, Tracy mentioned, the meta research, and, or you did, that you, you were looking at papers and, and trying to extract information from there. But I want to focus on this last part, which is what's happening now, that uh, we're defining the protocols and, and actually doing the experiments to, to do the data analysis and publish the, the results later. And, and here, I think, is what <clears throat> most people who, who don't do meta research can, can take lessons from meta research. So I'm framing this in terms of what if, what if I could go back in time and change the way we publish, the way we do science to make my life easier as I was doing this. So, uh, and I think uh, uh, some lessons can be derived from there. 
I'll mention protocols, data, and documentation. So uh, the first step for us, uh, once we had the experiments we wanted to reproduce, we had to, to get each one and, and take uh, extract a protocol from there, right? A step by step, uh, a step that, that could be followed uh, by, by the replicating labs. So we decided to do that without contacting the authors, mostly for pragmatic reasons. Of course, the authors have information that is not on the paper, but uh, it, this would take a long time and previous experiences showed us that this would most authors would not respond. So we decided to skip this step at this point and go only by what the information uh, by information that is available on the paper. So we had to get some method section that is usually written in, in some freestyle, right? Depends on the, the journal and, and on the author. And we had to convert this into a protocol that looks, this is an actual protocol from our initiative. It looks kind of like this, right? Uh, you, you have uh, the steps that were described in, in, in the method section, but we tried to structure it in chronological step-by-step -step order. And we also had a lot of information that was not present in, in, the, original art, in the original article. So we had to, to ask the, these questions to, to the, the people who were doing the replications, right? And this is uh, essentially about reporting, right? So uh, what's the, the thing that would change here is that we would have people reporting all this information that is actually essential. If you want to do the, the experiment, you have to decide what you're going to do. And if it's not informed in the original article, you, you, you have to, to guess or, or to, of course, an informed guess. You, you are also a scientist, but this is, is not in the original article. And what we use for this, and this is uh, the lesson I take, is that uh, thankfully there are lots of guidelines, right? They started in clinical research, but now they, they exist for, for many kinds of experimental designs and even for specific techniques. So for PCR, which is one of the methods we're, we're, we're replicating, uh, there's this MIKI guidelines, which is uh, essentially a list, a checklist of things that you should mention when you report your PCR experiment to make sure that all the important information is there if someone attempts to, to reproduce it. Uh, so, and this was the basis for the this questions we asked. You know, we asked the things that are in the checklist but were not in the original article. The second thing I want to mention is uh, the data. So we needed the data, and we needed the data from from the original reports, the original experiments, uh, for two steps mainly. Uh, first, when we are doing the protocols, we needed to define a sample size. How large will be this experiment when we attempt the replication? And the sample size was the sample size calculation was based on on the original effect size that the the, the original experiment reported, and uh, we needed to calculate this effect size. We know how large is the effect in the original, so that we can uh, choose an appropriate sample size. And uh, this process was really. Uh, let, let me mention first that the second part is the data analysis. In the end, if you're doing a replication, you want to compare somehow the results from your replications to the original one if you want to evaluate the, the published literature. And to do this comparison, we also need the data. We're actually running a meta-analysis that, that uh, Tracy mentioned in her talk, and we're comparing, uh, we're doing a meta-analysis of our replications and comparing that to the original. And well, to do that, I need to know the original value. And the process to get the data when the data is not reported in a structured format is actually very uh, tedious and, and you know imprecise because we, we have to, to uh, get the picture and you know, the graph where, where the data is reported. And we have to actually essentially count pixels. Of course, the software does that for you, but you're essentially counting pixels and doing uh, an estimation here, so, right? Uh, based on the axis and you, you just mark this on the software. Well, here's a hundred, here's three, and the software estimates for you what's the value of this point and what's the value of the error bars. But uh, uh, depending on the resolution of the images and, and tying this to, to what Yulia was just saying, uh, this might be like two or three pixels and you, you're trying to, to get an estimate from there. So this is very imprecise and very laborious. And what we are doing and what I wish people would have done if I were to, to to go back in time uh, is to, to report data in a structured format. So we are actually having uh, spreadsheets where people are going to, this is actually actually an example of one of our replication experiments where you, you report exactly the value that comes, the, the raw data that comes from the the, the machine that you're, you're using. In this case, it's a spectrophotometer. So it, it measures an optical, optical density and this is what we wanted to, to, to have. 
would be much easier to do. And it's really easy to share uh, structured data nowadays with many repositories that you can see below. Uh, the last thing is contacting the authors. We're doing this now just to see if the way we change the protocols is actually the way the, the authors would have done. And now we don't have the pressure of time, so we can do that uh, in tranquility. So uh, so this really depends if we're going to ask the authors, like uh, the information that was not in the article, if we're going to ask them, well, how did you do this that you did not report? Uh, it really depends on whether the documentation in the own, in the own their own labs is actually done in an organized way. So maybe they have this information in a laboratory and notebook that is like lost in some file drawer, or, or maybe they are using uh, some of those these uh, platforms that actually facilitate this work of managing a lab and managing protocols. Uh, and depending on, on how easy it is to get this information, they, it will be easy or, or hard for them to share this information with us. And this really depends on data management, right? If this is, um, you don't need to use one of those platforms, but if, if you have to have a system so you can find some information about an experiment that, that happened a long time ago. And of course, the last thing is, is uh, the authors have uh, uh, to be open to collaboration, right? They can just see our request for information and say, oh, I don't care. And, and this really blocks any, any further effort but uh, they have to be willing to collaborate. And, and a lot of those things I mentioned before, like using reporting guidelines or using a platform to organize your data or to uh, share your data in a structured format, all of that is uh, falls to me under this umbrella of openness to collaborate because you're really making it easier for people to build upon your work. It's not just direct replications that we are attempting here. It's just uh, if someone wants to, to follow up on something you did, it's easier for them if, if you already put all this information and have the results there. And, and my last point is that this is not just for others, and sometimes this is missing in, in, in people think about adopting the, those open science of meta research derived uh, insights, is that uh, the, the likely beneficiary is you in the future, because you know a month from now, when you discuss with your advisor and decide to change the experiment, you have to look back at your old protocol, and it's really good for you if you can, can uh, find it easily, and if it's really structured, and if your data is there in a way that you, you can really uh, easily replot the data or, or something because reviewer two asked. So uh, uh, this is what I, I try to keep in mind when, when trying to, to measure the cost benefit of this. So this is my message. Thank you. Thank you, Clever. Yeah, this initiative sounds like a lot of work. Um, important work, though, and I really look forward to seeing the results of this initiative once it's out. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their for their talks, and um, we'll now proceed to the Q and A section of the webinar. Um, thanks for all the questions we've received so far, and please continue to post questions um, that you may have in the chat box. It's still open, so um, if you'd like to ask there, you can go ahead. You can also tweet to us at at the rate eLife community using the hashtag PCR Wednesday. Um, so let me start off with a question from one of the panelists. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how exactly to pronounce the name, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but one of our panelists wanted to ask uh, Tracy uh, if she has received a hostile or negative attitude from scientists representing the status quo uh, during uh, her first publication, for example, that regards that that was about bar graphs. Um, and if 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 so, um, how did how did you manage it? So Tracy, that's for you. Um, so I would say that's a problem that we were very concerned about while we were doing the study because bar graphs are really standard of practice. We did a follow up study in 2018 where we found that amongst papers that had a data figure um, in peripheral vascular disease journals, almost 50% of them had a bar graph and it was the most common type of visualization ever um, that people were using. So we did a lot of work to really prevent that. And we did that by sharing drafts of the paper with a variety of colleagues and getting their feedback on the paper and revising and adjusting things before it was ever submitted. Um, once it went through to publication, I think the fact that we had data really helped us with the statistical reviewers in particular. Lots of people have written papers on this topic but the fact that we could show that 85 or 86 percent of papers in our sample had bar graphs for continuous data meant that it was clearly still a problem and one that urgently needed to be addressed. Um, and I think that many people who saw the paper felt that way as well. And then the visualizations 
in the paper made a very powerful argument that resonated with people. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we took more of a preventive approach. And then once the paper was out, the response was extremely positive. Um, it was circulated very heavily on Twitter. The paper was viewed more than 100,000 times in the first month that it was published. Most of what came to us was positive. Um, I'm sure there are people who didn't like it. Maybe they just didn't talk to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a question uh, for Yulia. Um, so one of the things um, that we tend to do perhaps as meta research, I mean, as, as any researcher is we tend to highlight things that were perhaps done badly or that need improvement. Um, but are there examples of things that you've come across that, that you think have been done well and um, something that we might like to encourage? Um, so Yulia, that's a question for you. Uh, yeah, so uh, repository is, uh, and uh, nowadays is a lot of uh, positive changes happening. And for example, the, the uh, repository and backup of the uh, original uh, results of the experiment is uh, uh, very admirable and helpful, you know, and uh, it's something that uh, is, uh, I wish would happen more often and the people who starting to do it, it's extremely uh, helpful also for the interpreting the data and also uh, it's uh, uh, nice that it's happening and uh, uh, Clearly that uh, there are wish that it would happen more often. Uh, and also I'm trying to adjust my own research to this uh, guidelines of the uh, reproducibility. Uh, but uh, uh, for those people who is already doing it and publishing, it's uh, uh, extremely uh, nice and admirable work, yeah. So you think the future is bright and not dark? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's very nice to hear. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have a question for Kleber as well. So, um, so I think that this reproducibility initiative that's being done in Brazil uh, right now is, is, you know, it's a lot of intensive work, but uh, is, is, are there other reproducibility initiatives that have been taken, uh, undertaken before uh, around the world? And uh, if, if yes, what have they shown or what lessons have we learned from, uh, from them? Yes, I think, well, <clears throat> the, the first initiatives of, of this kind were in psychology. So those, well, the, probably everyone here is aware of them, but uh, the audience might not, but there's the, the replication project psychology. There are the mini labs projects there. Well, they have three editions already going into a fourth, I think. And uh, those are in, in psychology, in, in biomedical sciences, I'm only aware of the reproducibility project cancer biology, which should be finished uh, well, if it hasn't been published yet, it should be it should be releasing their results uh, very soon. And but, uh, as far as I'm aware, ours was the first on to take the country as the, the level of analysis and, and to try to look at, uh, at the reproducibility of the science produced in a country. But uh, well, there there are indeed many many replication projects that came before, and we we actually borrowed a lot of the structure and. We learned a lot from them actually talking to the people who coordinate in those and and well at, at least you learn a lot even even if the results is not very informative in the end you, you le learn a lot about what i just talked about that uh how to reproduce papers and and how easy it is to reproduce papers and what we could change just to make this easier right and it, it's uh, just adding to, to what you asked uh should you there before uh, I, i'm very forgiving when i see a, a bad paper because a lot of a lot of these is very hard and, and laborious to do. You know, open science is not something that you just, well, I'm, I'm deciding now that I'm adopting every possible practice there are recommended. Uh, this takes a lot of work and, and much more work than people are used to. So it, it takes time and, and a lot of, of learning about reproducibility. I think it's uh, a learning how to, to, to make it easy for people to reproduce so that the, the incentive doesn't need to be that high for people to, to attempt to reproduce. So uh, I think uh, all the learning is in the process not necessarily in, in the number that, that's going to come out in the end. Yeah, thanks. Actually, that's quite nice. Um, so I wanted to know, uh, I think we were talking about this sometime back, that uh, there was a study to, that tried to reproduce key experiments in, in cancer. Um, so could you like talk a little bit about what's happened since then and, and what you think about that? And 
the major challenges that they have they faced, for instance, in trying to re reproduce key experiments uh, or that land the landmark papers of cancer. Yeah, this well, they the, the, their challenges are, are are different. So if you're going to read the, the reports from their experiments, they are trying to reproduce the whole paper, right? So this is a design choice we, we made very early that we're reproducing one experiment from one paper. So this is a very simple experiment, and and, and usually they are not uh, like they are not chained in that the first experiment is not really dependent on the, the second is not really dependent on the first so in the reproducibility project cancer biology they they did have a lot of problems with uh they, they couldn't establish the model so if you have a, a biological model that is very cutting edge and you can establish that it, the, the question of replication becomes really hard to interpret right because what do you do now is it a failed replication because you couldn't even establish the model but you couldn't really try the experiment because the experiment depended on having that model for you to, to test. So they did. Uh, uh, they also had much more uh, advanced and, and expensive techniques. So the problems they faced were, as far as I'm aware, much more in that line. And our problems are more about our experiments are really simple, and our problems are more. It, it should be easy to reproduce our, our, our the experiments we selected and uh, it could be made easier by, by the things I talked about. But our problems seem to be more and more prosaic. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have another question, which is for, which is for Tracy. Um, so how long does it uh, usually take to plan and execute a, a meta research study? And uh, can anyone do meta research? Or, or would you encourage ev everyone to just you know, do meta research? I think how long it takes depends a lot on the particular study, um, and it also depends on the size of your team. It's important to adapt the scope of the project to be something that your team can do. Um, one of the challenging things about meta research is there are a relatively small number of meta researchers right now, and it is very hard to find training in meta research. I would really encourage people who are seeing a problem in their field that they think meta research might be helpful in exploring to reach out to someone who has meta research experience. Um, just like, you know, if you're an epidemiologist by training, you wouldn't go running into a lab and that was in biochemistry and plan to write, design, and publish a paper in two months when you've never picked up a pipette before. It's kind of the same thing with meta research. It has its own skills and methodologies. And um, toolkit that it really takes time to develop and learn and understand and working with someone who knows some of those things and particularly the skills that are relevant to the question that you want to address um, can be very, very helpful in making sure that you're, you have a sound study design and that you will ultimately get the type of information that you want to know from your study. And then I think if you're doing a systematic yeah. review type thing, it's sure. really important to remember sorry. that. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. It's important to remember that. Um, it's important to remember that most stages involve two independent reviewers. And so depending on the type of your study that you're doing, these aren't necessarily studies that you can do on your own. You need to have, you know, more than one person involved in working together. Yeah, it takes a village to do science anyway. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, I think Vinod has a question to the panelists, which is, uh, do meta research projects benefit from pre-registration? Uh, and I think maybe Tracy, you could you could take this question. I think they certainly can, and many are pre-registered. We often don't register ours because they are often more exploratory in nature. We may be looking at issues that other have others haven't addressed before. Um, and yeah, we, we don't necessarily have everything finalized in terms of exactly how we're going to be able to look at the question. Um, so yeah, but there are other groups, particularly groups that do a lot of work with trials, um, that do pre-register their studies. And there are also some systematic review groups that use pre-registration. And it's definitely something that I would encourage people to consider if it's appropriate for their study type and study design. I see. 
Thanks. I think uh, Meha has a, has a couple of questions actually. So uh, it's it's similar to the first question, which is uh, how how has how is the response of journals uh, to meta research articles and their suggestions? So if you outline a suggestion or a policy change, uh, are there journals that have actively uh, made changes that you've suggested uh, based on uh, meta research articles that have been published? And um, I guess anyone could take this question, but maybe Tracy is the most experienced to answer this. I can start and then others may have other experiences to share. Um, so we have seen journals actively changing policies based on our work on data visualization to encourage authors to replace bar graphs of continuous data with more informative graphics. Um, there's a big difference between changing policy and having that policy actually implemented and enforced, and I think it's um, that's something that's much more difficult to journal for journals to achieve. So one of the approaches we've been pursuing now is to develop automated screening tools to make it easier to detect some of these things. Um, so I coordinate a group that has of people who have all kinds of automated tools, and we've pulled those into a common pipeline that we've been using to screen preprints throughout the pandemic um, and post information results from those tools public make public reports available through a website called hypothesis which is a web annotation tool and those reports are also tweeted out via SciScore reports on twitter um, in terms of the response to journals i think it's very it's complicated so there are many journals that don't consider meta research to be research and aren't willing to publish these papers. There are a couple of publishers like Plus Biology and eLife that have really embraced um, meta research. And I've just recently started guest editing a new collection for clinical science as well to make it easier to get this information out into journals that other scientists are reading. I think it's important that we are publishing these studies alongside normal science to send the message that this is important for you know, every scientist to know about and to be aware of. And it's not something that should be hidden away in journals that only meta scientists read because the goal is really to change and evolve how science is conducted. And that requires having an ongoing dialogue with scientists that goes both ways about both problems and solutions and how can we implement better practices in a way that works for everyone. Yeah, thanks. I think that was quite a comprehensive answer. Uh, but maybe I, I can also say that there are certain journals which have been open to adopting, um, you know, having checklists, for example, for statistical reporting or to improve, you know, I think uh, uh, the, the Springer journals, for example, have also implemented the fact that you shouldn't publish bar graphs with error bars. So I, I think there there is uh, there is some uh, some adoption of these policies from the journals end, but perhaps it's not as widespread yet uh, as as one would uh, as, as one would hope. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, I guess. Uh, that, Julia, if I could I just, ever... um... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just follow up quickly. Checklists are very popular right now. Um, I mentioned that one of the things about meta research is we can use it to look at solutions. Unfortunately, the meta research on checklists is not as inspiring as we wish it should be. Um, so I showed the meta research study on the arrive checklist at the beginning where just randomizing authors to complete the checklist didn't really have any effect on quality of reporting. And there are other meta research studies that also raise questions about the value of just publishing an editorial or changing a policy or posting a checklist. Some of them suggest that there is some impact, but it's not nearly as much as we would like it to be and we still have a long way to go. So I think checklists without enforcement aren't um, unfortunately going to be the major solution to our problems. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask a quick question to Yulia first. Um, I, I want to know, Given that uh, before starting off the uh, eLife Ambassadors program, um, you know, you had no prior experience in doing meta research. So, what was your experience like? Was it was it a daunting task? Was it scary to try and you know do this project? And um, you know, how do you think you fared uh, when you were when you were doing it? 
Yes, uh, on the beginning, when you understand all the amount of the work that should be done and put in the uh, uh, paper in order to continue and uh, to gather all the data, it's a little bit daunting, especially as an early career researcher working in a vet lab, you have to devote your time and uh, um, uh, split it. But uh, uh, actually, it's... Uh, um, this experience uh, helped me to educate myself and to see and to more critically uh, my own field and to, to be more reproducible and create uh, also uh, better image qualities. And uh, after seeing and uh, able, I am able to uh, abstract the data uh, much more faster from the papers. So even though that a lot of uh, things for the early career researchers in the science are daunting, they are also uh, tend to pay uh, in the uh, payback very well. So I would encourage any uh, early career researcher at least to start uh, interest in this topic. And uh, clearly uh, the good uh, supervision and guidance from someone who has uh, already done it on the initial steps are very important in order, in order not to get lost. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I have a question for Kleber, which is, uh, do you have any recommendation on adopting FAIR, uh, that is the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, compliant research data management plans for nationwide programs, uh, such as the Brazilian Reproducibility Network? Uh, yes, my recommendation, yes, please do. Uh, we, we did, so So I think the largest the project, the, bad, the, the most you benefit uh, uh, from, from making your data management uh, very clear and, and have a plan so we do we, we do try to, to be very open and adopt all the recommendations i just said so we're using uh, uh, the checklist and we are pre-registering uh, every every protocol the protocols well the, the, the protocols aren't public yet but they will be after the, the experiments are done and you can see much of, of the meta research we did before as set up for the initiative is already available and everything is on OSF. Uh, i can share the link later but uh, yeah you should this is we hope that this makes it easier for someone who later wants or even ourselves if we want to do a second initiative and try to reproduce a lot of experiments that we can learn from from our previous one because the data is there and and it's uh, usable and interoperable and reusable the data will be all structured and, and we're trying to follow our, our recommendations okay thanks uh, i have a question from Mugda, which is uh, is there a tool that authors can use before submitting their paper uh, to ensure that it's more accessible in terms of reproducibility and um, you know it reports uh, reports all the methods and stuff very well? So maybe maybe clever you could answer that. Is there something that authors can use now to, to try and check whether um, whether whether the paper is is yeah. doing I well? I think Tracy is the expert and and very familiar with those tools, right? Um, yeah, I think the first thing that you should do is look for a reporting guideline for the type of study you're conducting. So if you're doing human studies, go to the Equator Network website, um, and they have things like consort for clinical trials, the stroke guidelines for observational studies, PRISMA for systematic reviews. Um, ARRIVE guidelines is good for animal studies. There are also some options for in vitro studies, although Equator tends not to list those. The second thing that you can do is go to, um, there's an automated screening tool called SciScore, which checks transparency for certain markers. And so I believe if you sign in with an organ ID, you can screen five or 10 papers per year for free. Um, and then if you'd also like to learn more, we published a, a, a correspondence in Nature Medicine in January on our screening pipeline. And I'll tweet out a link to that afterwards from my Twitter account. Um, but that describes more about what the various tools in our pipeline look for. And once you know what we're looking for, it's pretty easy to tell like if your paper has a limitation section or other things. Thanks, uh, thanks Tracy. With that question, um, it brings us, that question brings us to the end of this time's uh, ECR Wednesday webinar. Uh, thank you to all the participants as well as all you attendees. Uh, we really hope you learned something new. Um, 
and enjoyed yourself. Uh, we really appreciate your participation and would be happy to hear your thoughts and feedback about the event. Uh, I've posted in a message um, in, the, in the chat, that's uh, an email ID uh, to which you can send in feedback. So please contact us at events at the rate elifesciences.org. Uh, if you'd like to ask follow-up questions to any of our panelists or provide us feedback. Um, so we also encourage you to post about this event on social media that, that you may use, um, ensuring that you use the hashtag ECR Wednesday uh, and tag at the rate eLife community. This is mostly Twitter. Um, uh, ECR Wednesday is a series of webinars, so it's not just this one, and we keep having one uh, almost every month. Uh, the entire the past editions of this webinar are, are available online, so please go to eLife's website and check them out. Uh, we'll, we'll announce the next edition of ECR Wednesday um, very soon, so keep your eyes open for that, and uh, hoping to see you then. Uh, until then, take care, stay safe, and thank you so much.